This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Two. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. Think Tech Hawaii has done a series of Community Matters with candidates that are running for election, and of course the primary is August 11. And we have interviewed people from as far south as South Point on the Big Island, all the way to Nihihau, and places in between. And we have talked to candidates from places that most people don't even know are in Hawaii. And today, though we will talk to one that everybody knows, he is our hero. He is Lieutenant Governor Doug Chin. Aloha, Doug. Aloha. And he, of course, is the one that stood up to the bully. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Trump the bully. <laughs> so he's the one that we all know. Doug, tell us about the Lieutenant Governor. About, about you first. Oh, great. Well, um, I, I'm actually the son of immigrants. My parents came from China to the U.S. back in the 1950s, um, actually during a time when there were some very, uh, very restrictive and discriminatory immigration laws that were in place. Um, but they came here anyway and sacrificed just like so many people who are immigrants to the United States do uh, in order to give the next generation a better life. So I have so much gratitude to my parents um, and they, they raised me to uh, care about doing what's the right thing. So that was in Seattle. You were born in Seattle. Yes, yes. My mom was a librarian at the University of Washington for almost 40 years and my father was a civil engineer but when he first came to the U.S. He was parking cars and, and just trying to uh, make his way in a world that was not his, his uh, original culture. Can, what part of China? Oh, um, near Shanghai, so uh, kind of near the central part uh, of, of China. Can you tell our audience about the Chinese Exclusion Act? Because most people, at young age anyway, have no idea just what your parents went through with the Chinese Exclusion Act. The Chinese Exclusion Act was something that took place right after uh, Chinese Americans who had come into the U.S. to help work on the railroads uh, ended up finding that the, the railroads were built and, and now they were taking jobs away from uh, other people or perceived as taking perceived, jobs away, yes. yeah, perceived as taking jobs away uh, from, uh, from other cultures. Uh, so what happened was these, uh, the other cultures started to say, well, you know, we shouldn't have Chinese people in, in the U.S. anymore. The coolies. Yeah, they called them coolies. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of political cartoons that, uh, that painted or showed uh, Chinese people looking like they were animals or that they were monsters. And, and so along with that, uh, there was a lot of decisions that were made, poor decisions, by, by Congress as, as well as uh, other leaders to exclude people who were Chinese from coming into the United States. And so uh, it, it was a very strict uh, discriminatory quota that Congress finally overturned uh, in the 1960s. Yes, and just for our audience, um, it was our Senator Fong who worked on getting rid of the Chinese Exclusion yeah. Act. Yeah. Again, most people don't know right. that far back. So. Then you went to uh, Stanford. I did, correct. Now, we think of Asians at Stanford as being the top of the, <laughs> the totem pole in the, in the curve. <laughs> intellectual curve. Is that true? Uh, well, I don't know about that, but it's a, it, it was a great school to go to and, and uh, I, I really uh, appreciated it. And, and in fact, my family sacrificed a lot even then. Uh, my, my parents, of course, took out a, they took out a second mortgage and, and my sister even worked uh, an extra job in order to help pay for my tuition. And, and to me, that actually speaks a lot of what, uh, what families and immigrant families, but families of all cultures really do, is that they all uh, do whatever they can to care for each other and, and help mm -hmm. people be successful. So I'm forever grateful to them for that. And Queen Lily Okalani contributed to Stanford University. Oh, yes, 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 that's so wonderful. <laughs> so after Stanford, growing up in that kind of neighborhood before you went away to school, 
Did you feel discriminatory as a child growing up in Seattle? Sure, uh, and I think that that just shows how much uh, Times have changed, although although I guess what we're finding is that maybe times haven't yep. changed so much. But but we were <laughs> I, I did face a lot of over discrimination of just you know being called like slant eyed or or you know being someone who's uh, you know I get teased about my name or just not being uh, from the 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 race that that most people were part of. Uh, my neighborhood was mostly white, um, and there were very few African Americans. There were very few Hispanic people. Uh, so so in that neighborhood, then I think it was easy for people who are minorities to be picked on. Um, you're showing a picture, actually, of my family, so yes. I just want to make sure that I point that out, because that's my sister and my parents. Um, that's when I graduated from law school. and, and um, When and you so graduated were, from? Correct, when I graduated from law school here at the University of Hawaii. So coming to Hawaii from that culture into this one, where uh, Asians are a major part of the culture. What was that trans transformation like? I mean, did you feel better? Uh, you could breathe easier being a part? For, for the first time, I, I didn't feel like a minority because I wasn't. And, and I also felt like there, there weren't any boundary lines in between cultures. Like, uh, I think one of the things that people end up seeing on the mainland is there's a lot more uh, sequestration amongst neighborhoods where uh, Chinese people just hang out with Chinese people, Japanese people just yes. hang out with Japanese people, Mexicans and Mexicans, and, and, um, and here it, it's just a melting pot. And to me, having been here for the past 30 years, uh, that is such a special story uh, that is, is really a unique one that can be expressed to people from all around the country, that when you come to Hawaii, you can see uh, mixed races, you can just see people who are, are all uh, being able to work together and, um, and function together successfully uh, because of the melting pot that we are. Now, you graduated from UH Law School, right. and most graduates from UH Law School think of going to work at some big <laughs> firm, but you decided to go into government. Correct. Why? Oh, um, well, my parents had always taught me to make sure that whatever I did, I was always giving back to the community. Uh, the other thing I really enjoyed was uh, part of being a lawyer was uh, the opportunity to be in court. And I, I really wanted to be interacting with people and speaking to juries. And so, uh, and so wearing a, a suit. My, <laughs> and wearing, I guess. <laughs> that, that wasn't so great, but, but, uh, but especially in the, in the hot weather. But, um, but Peter Carlyle is the prosecutor at the, was, was a prosecutor at the time, and, and he hired me on. And, and uh, during that time, I started off in traffic court, but then uh, over the years, then I eventually started doing uh, some very serious cases, mostly domestic violence and sexual assault cases. And then you went from just being a prosecutor to deputy prosecutor. What's the difference? Correct. So it, I, I basically became the number two person in the office, and, and so uh, I took on a lot more managerial and policy type uh, responsibilities. One of them actually w was uh, always advocating for the, the strictest common sense gun regulations that we currently have here in the state of Hawaii. And, and I, I'm very proud of that, that, that uh, even to this day, Hawaii is recognized as having the, the strictest gun control regulations in the country. And, and frankly, that is something that is potentially under threat by the it current is. administration yes, it is. if we don't do something about making sure that we're checking So then that. you went from the deputy prosecutor, which was where I met you, then mm. to the managing director of the city and county. So tell right. us about that. Yeah, that, that was a great experience. It, it was actually my first step into interacting with the city council as well as the state legislators and, and really understanding uh, just a, a lot of what uh, the, the political bubble is all about, and, and, but, and a good bubble that it is, because it, it really is a place where there are so many people who care about wanting to make the community better and, and really uh, get into a, a lot of conversations that sometimes just looks like people arguing, but actually is very productive in, in terms of being able to make progress here in Hawaii. Now, I must add a footnote here that when you were managing director and I was just somebody at the city council, that was the only time, or no, I shouldn't say only, the first time I can remember that the city administration and the council worked very well together. Oh, good. <laughs> and that's my own caveat. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then after you left there, you went to, when, when um, 
the term was over, then you went to... And then I was working at Carl Smith Ball. I was oh. the managing partner there uh, for a couple years. And then eventually when Governor Ige became our governor, then he appointed me to become the attorney general. And so I was the attorney general from 2015 to 2018 <laughs> for three years. <laughs> three years. Yeah, yeah. That's quite, yeah. Yeah, it was now, a great experience. Now, one of the things, and okay, I'll, let me look for it, was that nonsense, the mess with the uh, syrup, the molasses in the Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there was a very serious situation where, where one of the large shipping companies that, that brings uh, goods to, the, uh, to Hawaii uh, ended up spilling, uh, there was a molasses spill that, that, exists, that, that occurred within Honolulu Harbor. And um, it, it took a lot of working with the shipping company as well as um, several environmentalist groups such as the Sierra Club uh, and, and um, other major players including the current congressional delegation to come to come up with a, a great solution which uh, basically involved restoring the coral reefs and, um, and and also putting in a lot of money to be able to uh, build infrastructure to make sure that this doesn't happen again well now that one I remembered because that went on forever and ever so how did you solve that sure it, it was an, an example of something that was actually headed towards some very serious litigation that to my mind was going to last for the next decade like like in other words I, I could see easily that the the two sides were so far apart uh, you know, one side wanted you know basically a you know, billion dollars I'm exaggerating but but just something really high the other side wasn't really willing to pay that much um, and, and it looked like it would be something that would be dragged through the courts and in the meantime we wouldn't be having our reefs being restored we wouldn't have any money to do that um, so by bringing everybody together and working with both sides of it, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of mediation that had to take place, and I, I'm proud to say that I was part of that. Uh, to, and we were able to come up with a solution that was able to stop a very expensive, costly trial that would go on and on through all the courts uh, and bring immediate relief to Honolulu Harbor, uh, as well as to our ocean environment that's around Oahu. So what did they finally do to restore the reef? What ha finally happened? They put about um, $15 million into uh, taking down the molasses infrastructure as well as uh, providing funding to the state in, in order to be able to, uh, to help grow coral reefs um, just uh, around the south shore of Oahu. And that's great because that, um, that um, ecosystem is so important to the ocean and to the fish and the wildlife in, in Hawaii. Well, we need to take a break. And when we come back, we want to talk about your go-around with the bully in the White House. Okay. Right. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, The Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by and hear from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we at Think Tech are doing a series of interviews with candidates all across the state from the tip of the Big Island all the way up to Nihihau and everything in between. Candidates at places that we never dreamed existed. Mm -hmm. And today we are talking to the Lieutenant Governor, Doug Chin, who wants to leave us to go to D.C. <laughs> Not leaving. <laughs> go to DC. Representing, representing to, Hawaii. <laughs> to do battle with the bully Trump. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, Doug, uh <-huh. laughs> tell us about your event, your standing up to Trump and 
that taking it on with the, um, what is it, shutting down the, the ports, the airports Correct. and everything to immigrants. Tell us about that fight with him. Well, uh, President Trump had issued an executive order in the second weekend after he was uh, sworn in that, that banned travel from several Muslim-majority nations to come into the United States. And, and right away, it threw our airports into chaos. Uh, there was a lot of protests that took place. Uh, there were people who were being told midair that they couldn't come into the country. Uh, people went down to the Daniel K. Inouye International Airport, and, including other airports That's all right, around the country, uh, to be able to offer help. Uh, and I was the attorney general at the time, and I felt like we, we really need to do something here to, to stand up for immigrants as well as for, uh, as well as for uh, the, the rights of peoples that we don't discriminate against people based upon their nation of origin or their, um, or their religion. Uh, I think so many people here in Hawaii especially remember the, the discrimination that took place against Japanese Americans when they were interned as citizens, having done nothing wrong uh, during World War II and it was done for national security reasons. And I have well, nothing they say against- it, they said it, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. So, I, and I have nothing against national security. I absolutely believe it's the president's uh, prerogative to, uh, to take care of our national security. Uh, but we have to always make sure that, that our foundational principles are upheld, which is that we don't discriminate against people simply based upon their nation of origin or based upon their religion. That goes against the Constitution. So, what happened then? You, you filed the lawsuit, then what happened? You go from there to what sure, happened? Sure. Well, I, I'll tell you this really quick is that, I, I mean, I, I had a short interchange with President Trump himself when I was out there for a national attorney general's conference, and, and I was able to ask him, why is it that you've passed this, uh, this executive order? And, and he basically said, frankly, your priorities are not my priorities, which was just a, a great uh, po point of reference to be able to say, you know, hey, that's, that's exactly the reason why we need to be standing up and fighting for Hawaii's priorities because these values were being threatened. Um, we brought our lawsuit here in Hawaii Federal Court. Uh, a district judge uh, named Derek K. Aloha Watson, who was a President Obama appointee, a Kamehameha Schools graduate, had uh, basically uh, agreed with me and, and uh, issued a nationwide order that stopped the travel ban. Um, that got a lot of people's attention. Um, and then it went up to the Ninth Circuit. Their three-judge panel upheld it. So that was the next level up. And then the final level up for that was the U.S. Supreme Court. So just about, I guess, seven weeks now, then a five to four majority sided with President Trump um, and, and upheld the travel ban. Uh, however, there was four significant dissenters that, that said this is a very, this, this decision is seriously flawed um, and uh, history is going to end up judging us on this. And uh, I, I really believe that. I, I really believe that Hawaii is going to be on the right side of history of this um, and that we are going to be uh, shown as, as having done the right thing uh, during the right time. So you took step after step after step. Did they change the order? Did, was, did sure. they modify it at all? Along the way, there were some new versions that came out that were more neutralized, but they never took away the original statements that were behind it, which was that um, President Trump had always said that he wanted to call for a complete Muslim ban uh, of people coming into the United States. And, uh, and, and I think that in and of itself, you, 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 for, for all of us who are now sensitive to how these, these statements get made, Right away, it, branding people who are of a Muslim religion as terrorists, that, that, the fact that so many Americans even accept that, that statement just shows that we're, we're already in, in a bad place in terms of uh, how our minds have been you know, processed, how our minds process that concept. Um, the fact is, is that it, it's not your religion that makes your, you a terrorist. It's some very bad that's, decisions yeah, or, or just some, you know, some other things. Uh, but there are people who are not Muslims who have committed some atrocious gun violence um, it, within our country, and so um, and, and so. Anyway, that's that's just not the right thing to do. So, now, you have decided that you want to go to Congress. Yes. To, to represent us in Congress. Why? Well, one of the things <laughs> yeah. that I saw. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, one thing I can tell you is that is uh, I can say I ask myself that every night before I go, I, I go to I'm sleep. I'm sure your wife does. <laughs> Why too. am I doing this? <laughs> but but I will say this is that um, one thing I, I'll give you the serious answer, which is this is that um, one of the things that I saw as Attorney General is, is that courts can only do so much. They can only stop something or they can slow something down. But it's Congress that can really be proactive when it's functioning well to, in, in order to be able to make differences in, in the country. So to me, I, I just want to talk about this. I, I see that there are some very critical issues that, that are coming up right now from Washington, D.C., that if we don't address them, it's going to impact an entire generation. So one, obviously, is immigration. Uh, that this whole idea of just kind of um, blocking out people from certain continents and, and allowing or uh, you know, more welcome, being more welcoming to people from European nations, um, that impacts an entire generation if we don't really stand up and, and speak out against that. Uh, I think another thing that's very critical uh, has to do with gun control. Um, there, there's a, a lot of movement right now. Uh, the, there's a company that, that is trying to manufacture three-dimensional guns yes, in that's people's homes. A, a 3D gun? Co Mm -hmm. With no serial, no nothing? Correct, correct. Um, and, and so that's that has been, right now, as we're sitting here in camera time, then it's been upheld, or it's been stopped by a court, um, but it's only temporarily stopped, and so it's going to take Congress to make sure that that doesn't continue further. Um, there's another serious issue where Congress is trying to think about um, making states that have common sense gun regulations like us recognize the rights of other people who are coming into Hawaii so that we have to recognize their state's laws. Now that is not safe at all. No, and, um, and there's, this pains me to say it, but in this thing called states' rights? Correct, <laughs> correct, correct. So, so the fact that that's even coming up uh, means that uh, you know I feel like I am the right person as someone with a law enforcement background, as the attorney general, and as a prosecutor, uh, and also as someone who's a lawyer to really be able to make sure that Congress doesn't do anything that that will really affect uh, an entire generation. Oh well, now let's rewind back to the Federalist Papers when they made the decision that each state would be a state and not that the federal government would not interfere with the things that happen in each state. And that's my memory of the Federalist Papers. Right. That was the whole idea right. in creating this thing called United States. Correct. Correct. And, that, and, and our state laws that we've passed are ones that have been, really, it's been decades of work by state legislators, by governors, by, uh, by prosecutors, uh, to, and to, to really be able to advocate for uh, the, the gun regulations that we have here. We don't want there to be uh, the same kind of massive type of shooting um, that's occurred. We had one actually happen in 1999 with the Xerox shooting. Xerox. We never want that to happen no. again. And, and, so, uh, and so the idea of what's called reciprocity that's being talked about right now in Congress, that is something that I, I feel very motivated to, to stop and, and feel like I'm in the best position to be able to stop it with my background. Um, yes, I agree with you. And assuming, of course, that you do get elected and you're one of four, and it takes 218 people dem of any party to get a bill to the floor, how do you think that you can make a difference in moving enough other people to make that 218. Right. It starts with working closely with our own congressional delegation. So I, I think the fact that uh, we have four uh, is <laughs> from Hawaii. It's a small number, uh, but it can be a very loud number when, when there is seniority that can be built. And so one of the things that I feel like I bring to the table is just turn 52. Uh, and, and so I feel like, God willing, if I've got good health, then, then I have another good 20, 25 years to be able to build seniority out there. Uh, which I think is actually in contrast to some of my other candidates. I mean, some of them I think are, uh, they have less years ahead of them, and, and I think other people um, don't have the, the right type of experience that, that really prepares them for being in Congress. Yeah, now, I th I'm agreeing with you. I think that your experience, especially in these areas that you mentioned, immigration, 
gun, gun control. control. And, and, and that, that the other thing is women's rights and LGBTQ yes. rights, which are completely under attack. Oh, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, Roe versus Wade is looking like it'll get overturned with the addition of a new uh, conservative Supreme Court justice, uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Um, that's very concerning, um, as well as LGBTQ rights being rolled back from all the progress that's been made. And as the Attorney General, I have taken strong stances to make sure that we don't defund Planned Parenthood, that we are standing up for the rights of same-sex couples, and, um, and so I, I would continue to be a staunch advocate in those areas. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you because you were right here on this program when you, we first took a stand on marriage equality, and yeah. you were right here in this very seat Right. supporting it and supporting cannabis mm -hmm. and medical aid and dying. You have been totally supportive in all of those issues and all of which are under attack, by yeah, the way. I was right. going to say that. Washington, like, DC, so, how we so, always yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> correct, correct. So, do we always choose something that has to be under attack? Well, I, I no, <laughs> to, to me, I, I think that's that's why Hawaii is so awesome is because we, we really are on the, the cutting edge uh, of so many things that, that I think are good for the next generation and, and good for our future. So, so to me, uh, th this is a really critical time. You know, we're, we're, we're at a very serious time when we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can to be able to uh, stand up for Hawaii's values. Well, now, would you um, be so kind as to tell us why we should vote for you on August 11, or let's see, voting has already started. Early voting has already mm -hmm. started. So why we should vote for you? Right. So first of all, I, I would say this. I, th I think for people who've already voted, I want to thank them for voting, regardless of who it was, because they were part of the process. And by far, that is the most important thing. Um, if they haven't voted yet and they're still undecided, uh, I, I'd encourage them to look at my website, dougchin.com, because I think it talks a lot about uh, my priorities as well as my background and, and why I think I'm the best person to be representing Hawaii and Washington, D.C. in 2018. I, I think, frankly, this is a very critical time for the country, and, uh, and I just feel like we, we need someone who's a former attorney general, who's a career prosecutor, who can really be able to hold Washington accountable um, and, and also be able to work with the congressional delegation to, uh, to be able to see that Hawaii's priorities are met. So hoping I could get that opportunity. <laughs> um, it's been great just to be able to meet so many people from Oahu. I, I feel very blessed uh, to be able to have that experience. Well, thank you so much for always being there. And I wish you the best of luck. Great. Thank you. And aloha. Aloha. We'll see you next time.